It's Matt with Bicubed. Today we're talking speakers. In a blind listening test, will a $500 studio monitor outperform a $50 bookshelf speaker? This is a question a friend of mine and I went really overboard trying to answer. Let's rewind a few years. My friend and I took a bunch of speakers, put them on a table, covered them in a black cloth, level matched their volume, and then played clips of music in a random order for a bunch of our friends and asked them to rate on a scale of 1 to 10 what they thought. Afterwards, we took the results, analyzed them, and found out, maybe not surprisingly, that people seemed to agree for the most part on what they liked and what they didn't like. There were a lot of issues with that first blind listening test and we wanted to remedy them the second time we did it. The first order of business was build a high-powered turntable to rotate the speakers into the same position. Unfortunately, that led us to the second problem that we had to solve, which was how do you keep the wires from twisting into a knot when you're spinning speakers around randomly? It turns out there's a device called a slip ring that solved it for us, and they're pretty darn cool. Next, we had to write a bunch of software to control the experiment, randomize the speaker order, and trigger the playback. Finally, we had to test the whole contraption. Bonus points if you manage to throw a really expensive speaker across the room. All right, what makes a speaker sound good? Or even better than another speaker? Is it good bass? Crisp highs? Clear treble? Wide soundstage? Precise imaging? There's a lot of ways to describe how a speaker sounds, and reviewers are always coming up with new descriptors. But shouldn't there be an objective way to quantify how a speaker sounds? Well, it turns out a lot of research has actually been conducted in this area on the subjective preference listeners have for various loudspeakers. So it goes something like this. Play various musical selections through different speakers hidden from view and ask people what they like. Objectively measure those speakers with something called a spinorama and see if there are any correlations between people's preferences and the objective measurements. I'm sure you'll be shocked to learn that people do have a preference. They prefer a speaker with flat on-axis frequency response. You could describe this as neutral. That is, the speaker reproduces sounds the same way they were recorded without adding additional colorations to it. Here is what a spinorama of an excellent speaker looks like. This line across the top is the on-axis frequency response. We want to see this as flat as possible. I won't go into detail what all these other lines mean, but generally speaking, the flatter they look and the more they follow each other, the better. I'll have some links below that will describe in detail how to read this chart and what all these lines mean. We rounded up a bunch of friends, we sat them down, we hid the speaker turntable behind a screen so they couldn't see what they were listening to, we played a selection of music for them, and randomized the speakers that they were hearing in different orders. We asked them what they thought about it and recorded the results. We took this data and we asked someone with a stats background to run some analysis for us. And this is what we got back. A repeated measures analysis of variance, ANOVA, found no significant difference in the sound ratings for the five different speakers. So what does this mean? Well, the results we got might simply be random chance, and we can't be certain that one speaker was actually preferred over the other. We'll show you the results, but beware. Here are the results plotted by mean preference score with a scale of 1 to 10. The JBL came in first at 6.2, followed by the Neumann in second at 5.8. The edifier with equalization came in next at 5.6, followed by the RCF at 5.2, and finally the edifier without equalization scored 4.6. So now that you've seen the results of the overall listening test, I can talk about my personal experience. I also rated the JBL as the best sounding speaker, probably because if you look at its anechoic data, it reaches slightly lower in bass frequency, and so that extension was apparent on certain tracks and probably accounted for the slightly higher preference rating. The Neumann came in close behind it, um, and depending on the track, may have scored higher or may have scored a little lower than the JBL for me. I will say the value of the JBL is hard to beat. It was the highest scoring speaker in our test, and at only $300 for a pair is pretty amazing. Well, I think that about wraps it up. If you want to learn a lot more about how speakers sound in rooms, I can't recommend highly enough Sound Reproduction 3rd Edition by Floyd Tool. It really provided the basis for most of what we did here. and if you want to know all the details about how this test was conducted, pictures behind the scenes, there's a link below to our write-up. 
And finally, thanks to Amir at Audio Science Review for loaning us the speakers that we used in this test. Oh my god. It's possible. I'm like, well, that sounds terrible. And the next one's like, uh, that sounds terrible too. They all sound terrible. Let's just go backwards through them.